So why do we need to assess body fat? Well, as you um, probably are aware, um, it's a weigh-in gives us a very rough indication of what's going on with our body. We don't necessarily know how fat we are. The, fatter, the more fat we have on our body, the sort of worse it's going to be for our performance. So we use calipers here because it's the um, best method, not a non-invasive method to use um, for fat testing. Quite easy, you just use the calipers that are in this box, you pick a person all over 12 sites, and it gives you a very good indication of what their body fat status is. You can pay a lot more for things like hydrostatic weighing, which will probably give you a little bit more accurate um, results, um, but that also cost a bomb, and it's not very convenient. So this is why we use caliper testing here. Can't really fit a pool downstairs. Um, the reason I put skinny fat people up here is I've come across quite a few people who are measured to look at you and think, oh, they're quite lean, they're fine. Um, and actually their body fat percentage comes up higher than what they would want it to be for their event or for their look, etc., etc. So this is another reason why it's important to actually have your body fat <coughs> tested. Um, as I mentioned before, excess fat is dead weight. So if you're a guy, if you're looking to do triathlons, etc., and you're carrying about 20% body fat around with you, it's gonna, you're going to have to be producing a lot more power than the guy next to you who's 15% body fat to get around um, the course. Um, and this was highlighted by Dr. Jensen, who um, says in his literature, he talks about uh, the power to weight ratio um, in endurance events. So what sort of body fat percentage are we looking at? Well, if you want to be like these guys, you've got to be looking at 5 to 8 for a guy, 10 to 14 for a woman. That's the optimum range which um, these guys who wrote the book, Better Training for Distance Running, this is what they found in um, top athletes. Depending on how serious you were taking your running and your endurance events, it's depending on, it's going to be a lot of hard work trying to get to 5 to 8 percent body fat, etc, etc. So, what we're going to look at now is ways in which we can reduce our body fat levels. And then later on, uh, in a few moments, we'll look at how we can apply this to endurance events. So, first of all, myth busting. There's more to fat than calorie counting. Everybody knows what a calorie is? Yep. And everybody's aware that, you know, people are told in the media, you know, count calories, keep things low fat, etc., etc., etc. Yeah? I've put on here, and um, everybody understands that 3,500 calories is equal to a pound of fat. Okay? Everybody come across that? Mm -hmm. Now, this has been um, looked at by various obesity researchers. One person that comes to mind is Zoe Hark, and I'll put up in a minute. And she's got a really good website. She's come from Cambridge. She's just researched, she's researched about 10, 15 years about obesity, um, et cetera, et cetera. And she there's been some various conferences run by uh, governmental organisations, obesity organisations, and asked them where they come up with this figure that they keep telling everybody there's 3,500 calories in the pound of fat, therefore we need to uh, look at that when we look at using fat. And what they've told her, not one of seven governments and obesity organisations can provide evidence for even part of this formula. So when she's actually asked them, no one's there like, so why are they telling people to eat 3,500 or to reduce um, you're calibrated by 3,500 calories. So it's a bit misleading and there's not a lot of uh, scientific backup. And when she's gone back, and it's on her website, I'm not going to go through it here because we haven't got the time, we'll be here for about another 10 or 15 minutes. She's gone back through a formula and she's found that it's probably that a pound of fat could equal, depending on the research you look at, anywhere, but I think it's something like between about 3,200 and 3,800 calories. So it's very misleading if you're using that as a um, determinant for, as a variable for fat loss. And also, to look as blankly as what goes in comes out is pretty one dimensional. Calories uh, are not independent. Whatever you eat will determine whatever you expend, as we'll find out in a minute. So looking at the research behind calories, we've got the Women's Health Institute, and I have to just look at my notes here because I can't remember the exact figures. So they took 20,000 women, and these women were told to eat a low-fat low, uh, low fat diet and a high-fiber diet to try and help fat loss. So over eight years, these guys were given regular counseling, they were, given, they were filling out food diaries, etc., etc. And the researchers found that on average, the women ate 360 calories less a day. Um, and after eight years, 
the average weight loss was about two pounds, and their abdominal fat increased. So that, again, <laughs> puts a bit of a, a blunt nor on the calorie um, concept. Although the research did say maybe that, you know, the, uh, their assessing food intake wasn't, maybe that could be it, because, you know, when people fill out food diaries, they don't necessarily fill, out, um, fill it out truthfully. Um, but um, that's something to take into consideration. There's another really good study, the Minnesota experiment, um, and you've probably heard of you starve yourself and then when you go to eat again, you will put on more body fat. And this, um, this, this study highlighted the fact. So you put people on a 1600 calorie diet, um, which the, and they lost about 20 to 26 percent of their weight. Um, then after uh, the 24 weeks they were on this diet, they were told they could eat whatever they want. They had a complete binge. Things settled down after a few weeks, and when they re-weighed them and re-measured them, they were 75% higher than what they were at the beginning. So again, that, that, puts into, that puts into perspective this idea of cutting down calories to help fat loss. It's not the best method. And Griffith's got that, he's highlighted in his book, Get the Diet Trap, and other few studies which show, which highlight this. So what is fat loss all about? And it's important to understand this if you guys want to um, use fat loss to improve your performance. We have here leptin. Has anybody heard of leptin? No? Okay. Leptin's a hormone secreted by our fat cells. So all the fat in our tummy, around our bottoms, on our thighs, etc., etc., secretes leptin. And leptin communicates with your brain, it's the hypothalamus part of your brain. And the hypothalamus will control your um, metabolism and it will control your appetite depending on how much leptin is being produced. So the more fat, so the more you eat, so I go out on a binge and go out for curries and beers and stuff, what will happen is that my fat cells will grow, therefore more leptin will be produced, the hypothalamus will then say, right, we've got to control this bad boy, so we're going to increase your um, metabolism and we're going to stop your, slow down your appetite. Okay? And that's how it should work. Uh, so... During a famine, so when you, do, when you go the opposite way around, so when you starve yourself, you have a decrease in fat cell size, so there's less leptin produced, so then the brain tells the thyroid, etc., to increase your metabolism, uh, sorry, you yeah, have to de uh, increase your decrease your metabolism, sorry, and increase your appetite to try and get you to eat. It's all about your survival mechanisms when we were hunter-gatherers. And that's obviously highlighted in the Minnesota experiment and stuff that's supported us. So you ask yourself, why can't big people control their appetite? Surely if um, they're pigging out all the time um, and their fat cells are increasing, they'll have this mad metabolism and they shouldn't, be eating, they shouldn't feel hungry. But obviously we know they tend to do. And this is known as leptin resistance. And leptin resistance basically means that there's, no there's a lack of communication between the brain and these leptins. And what happens is you get see adaptive protein which binds to leptin to stop the communication. Um, so then the brain thinks that there's no leptin being produced, so it keeps increasing your um, appetite and decreasing your metabolism when you go into the cycle. Okay, so what we need to do is look at controlling leptin and look at becoming less leptin resistant. And you guys here look pretty lean, so you may not um, fall under this category too much. So, what causes leptin resistance? We've got fructose, which is found in everything, from your Coca-Colas to your, um, possibly some of your sports drinks, etc., etc. So you've got to look out for that. Triglycerides, which um, triglyceride, an increase in triglycerides is related to um, too much carbohydrates in the diet, and especially refined carbohydrates. Overeating in general, calorie restriction, and what's known as insulin resistance. So insulin. If we look at insulin, insulin and leptin pretty much does the purpose. So, uh, let's see what. Dr. John Briffer, uh, he's again a really good. Um, hello. hello. Okay, so Dr. John Briffer, the obesity researcher, he's states that insulin plays a key role in the deposition of fat in the body and will basically make you, um, make you fatter. So we've got to look at insulin and the main food that um, 
produces insulin in secretion is carbohydrate, and especially these refined carbohydrates. So how insulin is secreted by the pancreas? We have a quick look. The pancreas will secrete glucagon and insulin to regulate blood sugar. So when we have a pasta meal or when we have a um, rice meal or something like that, and obviously endurance runners, we do need your carbohydrates. The pancreas will secrete glucagon if your blood sugar is too low and it will secrete insulin if your blood sugar is too high, and it tries to keep blood sugar within a certain range. That's the idea of, uh, um, that's part of the job for the pancreas. Insulin is secreted in two phases. When you see your lovely pasta carbonara, that's when it first starts uh, secreting, and when you start to eat it, that's the second part. Um, what insulin does, so insulin's job is to regulate your blood sugar. When you've got too much blood sugar, it has to deal with that blood glucose. And what it tends to do is going to communicate with your liver cells and your muscle cells, and it's going to put the um, excess blood glucose into the cells. So you'll have muscle glycogen and liver glycogen. About 60% of the meal should be stored in the liver as liver glycogen. Okay, and the rest goes into your muscles, and then if there's any extra, it goes into your fat cells for later. So, what we need to be, this needs to be working perfectly for us to stay lean. And in biosignature, there's a site which is known as a subscapular site, which is just here, underneath your shoulder blade, and it is strongly related to how insulin sensitive, to, uh, insulin sensitive you are. So, the ability of how many carbohydrates you can take on. So where as a practitioner we look at this site. According to Charles, the guy who came up with the whole concept of biosignature, if that figure is below 10 mil, that means we can start introducing carbohydrates throughout the day of the person we're dealing with, if they need to get their body fat percentage down. Okay? If the site is under 10, then uh, if the site is over 10, then we've got to look at carbohydrate and we've got to look at uh, when we should be eating these, and especially as you as endurance athletes uh, who need to get your body fat down, maybe if you find your body fat's too high, it might be possibly that you're taking in too many carbohydrates, and especially refined ones. So we look at insulin resistance, and that's the opposite to being insulin sensitive. So this, what, this is what happens. You keep eating carbohydrate, you keep producing uh, liver, you keep producing uh, insulin, what happens is that the muscle cells and the liver cells start to clam up. So they don't want this blood glucose, they've got too much, they're like, bugger off, we don't want you here. So then what happens needs to happen, that uh, excess blood sugar needs to go somewhere, because obviously if you go up, you'll, you'll go up and up and get hyperglycemic. Um, so this is a vicious cycle that goes, goes round and round, and what if I just... <laughs> okay, then glucose... So what happens is that glucose will then convert to glycerol. Glycerol attaches to these triglycerides that I was talking about earlier, and then triglycerides are basically stored fat. So all the fat that's around your body that you don't like, that is basically triglycerides. And it's the body's ability to mobilize these triglycerides and put them into the bloodstream and get them to, uh, to be used as energy. The better your body can do that, the, better, the more leaner you will become. Okay. So we talked about the subscapular side. And then within the cell you've got key enzymes which are pulling these free fatty acids from the blood into the cell and so on and so forth. And insulin has been related to um, these, these enzymes. So you've got LPL. And what that does, that will pull the triglycerides from the bloodstream into the cell. Now the more insulin you produce, the more lipoprotein, lipase, will be pulling triglycerides into your blood um, cells. So we don't want these guys that active, if possible. And then we've got the opposite. We've got um, their antagonists, which are hormone-sensitive lipase. And what these guys do, these break down the triglycerides within the cell and then feed them back into the bloodstream. So when you've got low, um, so when you've got high insulin, these guys won't be working as well. So when you've got low insulin, these guys will be working hard to try and um, get rid of get the cell, get the fat back into the bloodstream and get, the, get it working for your energy. What causes insulin surges? So, these are things you guys have to be looking for if you're interested in losing body fat for your running events. Booze. Okay? 
if you are going to drink, the best drink to drink is Rioja. Okay, it has less effect on your blood sugar and it contains um, anti cortisol properties such as resveratrol. When you say you mean just red wine? Sorry? Do you mean all red wine? Rioja is the best one, okay. but then you sort of work backwards. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want Rioja. No, I'm just wondering if you are. If you are I tell, I tell my clients and, and people, I say red wine, if you can go for Rioja, go for Rioja, if you go for red wine, and they still tend to do well. Obviously, without pointing the obvious out, the more booze you drink, the um, worse it's going to be for you. But it's <coughs> clear of things such as lagers, spirits, ciders, white wine, champagne, sorry. Um, it will do you the world of good if you want to try and get that body fat down. Polyunsaturated fats. There's been a massive rise in the past 30, 40 years of polyunsaturated fats. Does anyone here eat margarine? No? Yes. Okay, ditch the margarine and put butter in your fridge or leave it on the counter. That's great. Polyunsaturated fats has been told to uh, uh, we've been informed by the press that this is the best thing, the healthiest thing to eat. However, there's a very strong link between polyunsaturated fat, vegetable oils, so on and so forth, and things such as heart disease, etc. 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 So polyunsaturated fats they also have a strong link to insulin surges. So Get the butter out of your um, diet, get the cakes out of your diet, anything where they heat these vegetable oils to high heat, they become rancid, they create free radicals in the body, um, which are highly inflammatory um, atoms which will cause all sorts of issues with your insides. Okay, so which we don't want we don't want happening. Caffeine. So caffeine in the diet. Now I know who drinks coffee? Everybody. <laughs> And this is one thing I don't tell my clients. I do not fit in between somebody and their coffee. If you can restrict your coffee to one or two, preferably one, in the morning, and you still find you can reduce your body fats, that's why it's quite important to get tested in this sense because then we can see what's going on and make changes with your diet accordingly. Then, fine, we're happy. I've read somewhere in one of Charles's websites that caffeine, uh, coffee actually increased the lifespan by five years. So. I don't know where he's got that from, probably on a rat somewhere. But caffeine, just be careful of it, don't have too much. Same for green tea? Green tea contains caffeine, but nowhere near as abundant as... Um, and green tea is very good for reducing cortisol. So, in a sense, it's a good thing to have green tea, but again, be aware that it does contain caffeine and don't have, like, 25 cups a day sort of thing. <laughs> uh, so stress. So stress will increase insulin. Okay, so... Anyone with stressful jobs out there, you're going to find it hard to do the way of sleep. Sleep has been very, very strongly linked to body fat loss and especially around the stomach. If people can't sort out their sleep, and we're talking about eight hours sleep a day, straight through, no waking up for wee breaks or etc. etc. If you live with my children, you're definitely sleep deprived, um, then you're going to find it hard because sleep will increase cortisol. Sleep deprivation makes you want to eat. There's very strong research with people who, where then when they're deprived of sleep, they tend to gorge the um, sugar. I was, the other day, I had a poor night's sleep with one of our childs getting up, and I was just hunting, hunting around for crisps and stuff like that. <laughs> like I didn't find any. But yeah, sleep. So get, get your sleep in. Um, the body regenerates itself best between the hours of. Um, 11 and 1 in the evenings. If you're going to bed at 1 o'clock, you're not going to get the best rest, especially once you guys start running and training lots and you want to preserve muscle tissue and there's muscle breakdown going on, you want to try and maintain that muscle tissue, you want to get that sleep in. Uh, get that sleep in. It's very important. Low activity levels, hopefully that doesn't apply to you guys. Um, toxin, so toxin within the environment. So we live in London, unfortunately, so we're surrounded by toxins all the time. Then you've got toxins found in the pesticides on your food. So if you can go organic or free range, that's even better for you. Um, wash your vegetables. Um, don't drink and don't keep pouring water into plastic bottles and reusing the bottles, that sort of thing. Try and drink filtered water, get yourself a Brita filter. All those sort of things will reduce toxicity and help you reduce body fat. Okay, toxicity as we found with um, one or two people I've measured this morning um, is related to um, leg fat. So 
So if you find you put a lot of weight around the legs, it's probably to do with what's known as xenoestrogens, which are which are estrogens which are mimicking type substances that mimic estrogen in the body. The more estrogen you have, the more fat you put on around your legs, according to the biosignature principles. Um, other things to look out for are creams and lotions and potions and stuff like that. Good website if you're interested in the toxin side of things is the Environmental Working Group. They're an American company and they put out there the most toxic fruits. Bear in mind it was measured in America. Um, and they go through creams and sun tax, sun creams, and all those sort of things that you should look for that contain these um, xenoestrogens. So environmental working group, very good website. Uh, and the big one is carbohydrates. At the bottom, that's why I put that in comes. So this probably applies to you guys um, the most. So obviously, I hope you guys know what carbohydrate is. It's generally for food, um, potato, pasta, beans, that sort of stuff, and vegetables and fruits and cornflakes. Um, what you've got to look out for is the glycemic, does everyone know what glycemic load and glycemic index mean? <laughs> Every not. No, 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 yes, no, yes. Okay, so the glycemic load is slightly more accurate than the glycemic index. The glycemic index um, basically measures the, how quickly your blood sugar surges once you've eaten a carbohydrate meal. Glycemic load takes into consideration the actual weight of the food. So, for example, the glycemic index of a watermelon is 72. 100 is the highest. Um, if there's, if there's 5 grams of carbohydrate in watermelon, and obviously lots and lots of water. So, what you do, you take the 72, you times it by the 5 grams, you divide it by 100, and you come up with 3.6 glycemic load. 10 is highest for glycemic load, so that's a much better glycemic content. So, always use glycemic load, don't use glycemic index, if you can. So, we are told by the Daily Mail, etc., and whoever else you may read, to eat lots of grains and vegetables and potatoes and pasta and breads and so on and so forth. A bit of vegetables, so on and so forth, goes up to fat. Since this pyramid came out, diabetes, um, other sort of fat-relating diseases has increased. I mean, it's a coincidence, but um, all the people I read, you know, completely... Believe it. So, high protein. So, we've got the, the DGA 30 year critique. This is a dietary guidelines of America. And what they're showing, they basically went over all the research done in the last 30 years on um, diets, etc. And they found high protein diets gain better results and low fat in uh, and high carb diets when it comes to fat loss. Okay? So, what we've got to look at is the consumption of fat over the past 30 years has decreased. So not many people are eating fat anymore in their diet. Uh, exercise also increased. We're more exercise, fed, more exercise conscious. If you probably go down the, te the River Thames 40 years ago, you'd probably see less people running up and down than what you did this morning, especially on a day like today. Carbohydrate intake has also increased, and especially the refined stuff, the stuff all the white processed rubbish you find. Um, and obviously obesity and diabetes has increased as well. So what to eat and when to eat it, and this is what I believe. And here we go. So what we've done, this is um, the food diary that we, I sort of live by. So we've got lots of vegetables and stuff at the bottom, loads and loads and loads of vegetables. Then we go into sort of your meat range, a bit of fruits. Then we've got really good fats from avocado, um, etc. And then you sort of work your way up to more slightly grainy stuff at the top. So the main thing is eat real food. Don't buy processed food. The more f there's a very strong link between processed food consumption and obesity. And sorry, diabetes. Keep your glycemic load per day below 40. This was written, this, I found this in a book by Lauren Codain, who's a paleo diet expert. And um, he... For fat loss people, this is what he's found works best with his clients. Um, eat three to five smaller meals per day, so no big pasta meal at the end of the day when you're starving because you haven't had time to eat. Um, try and follow a type paleo. When I put paleo diet on there, it means eat how we used to eat hundreds of years ago rather than nowadays. So drop the pizzas, etc., and try and stay in for the meats and the fish and all the stuff that we used to hunt and gather for. Then you've got water. This is an equation by Charles. Um, 
Not sure where the data we've got, um, where, what piece of research you use to find that, but if you use 0.39 milliliters per kilo body weight, that's the sort of hydration um, which he's found works really well with his clients, etc. Um, and try and avoid grains, legumes, or sugar. Everyone on a legume like kidney beans and then peanuts and so on and so forth. Peanuts, not a nut, by the way. If anybody thinks we should eat nuts. Okay, so why no grains, legumes, and sugars? Grains and legumes contain things called phytates. Phytates bind to magnesium, calcium, etc., etc., and stop the absorption in the body. It's not a very good thing. They're also quite appalling if you compare a uh, uh, legume with like another carbohydrate, like a broccoli or a green bean or carrots or something like that. The nutrient comparison is obviously way, way better in the vegetable without the anti-nutrient anti -nutrient thing going on. Sugars are related to insulin and leptin resistance, that's pretty obvious. There's a strong association between grain consumption um, and people with gut issues. So if you find you get one good test to do is obviously eat something grainy <laughs> and eat a lot of it and see if you get bloating and stuff like that and that will probably tell you that um, you're, you don't cope too well with um, grains. You can obviously get tested by nutritionists, and we're going to be doing some testing here later this year. Um, and a guy called Dr. Alexander said, one in 33 people in the US has celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disease. So, the high protein diets tend to win hands down, and this is the research I've gathered together, cherry picked for you. Uh, no, <laughs> Dr. Raven's research at Stanford University found that people put on a high protein diet, they improved their insulin sensitivity. So, you guys. To be a good thing. A recent study published in the New England Journal for Medicine found that out of 938 adipose subjects, subjects that ate the high protein diet, low GI diet did the best. Um, and a guy called Weichely, or Wichely, um, found a high protein and resistance exercise, and this is quite an important thing, especially with you guys, is better than conventional diet. Just go a little bit into the exercise thing. When I get clients who are not runners, and this obviously doesn't mean you guys, we put them, we tell them, no cardio. If you're going to do cardio, you do high intensity cardio. Long intensive, long endurance cardiovascular exercise increases cortisol, which breaks down muscle tissue, and um, increases insulin resistance, so on and so forth. So we don't want to do too much of that as somebody who wants to get somebody to lean up. We get them to do resistance weights. We get them to do sprints. Um, and we put them on a, a higher protein, eat real food diet. And um, one guy in five weeks just lost, bearing in mind he was very good, um, six kilos of fat in five weeks. So he's done really well. He's dropped like about from 23% to 16% body fat. So there's just an example. But bear in mind people are different when it comes to fat loss. We're not, I'm not saying that everybody will get the same result. Um, <coughs> Research continues. When you say sprints, I thought that raised cortisol, the intervals, as opposed to. Not as much as endurance events. Everything would raise cortisol, like weight training would raise cortisol, yeah. but um, the endurance, endurance is, is okay. highest. Dr. John Briffer compared 13 relevant studies. So in his book, he looks at 13 studies that he's found um, since the year 2000, which compared these diets and um, these two diets. And out of them, the low carb diet had a much better fat loss. And the average weight loss in the low carb was 7.6 kilos compared to 4.7. So there's quite a big difference when it comes to um, body fat loss. So why? This is just some research about why we should, why I've been, why I'm trying to convince you guys to try and give you information about why we should be eating real food in like a cake. Study here by Dr. O. Dia. I'm just going to read it, sort of see it from here. He basically looked at Aussie Aborigines, and basically they were settled into a rural western of civilization like how we live yeah what he done he took these guys back out of civilization because they all developed they all became overweight and they developed type 2 diabetes and for seven weeks he put them back into their sort of natural setting of hunter gatherer type person and after seven weeks he found they lost 16.5 pounds of fat a 12 percent decrease 12 percent decrease in cholesterol 72% decrease in triglycerides, insulin and glucose metabolism normalized, and diabetes disappeared. So that's quite a good findings when it comes to the paleo sort of way of eating. 
There's a guy called Limburg who compared the paleo and the Mediterranean diet, which is like low, which is high fiber, high carb, low fat sort of diet. And he found that the glucose tolerance, um, although it improved on both, the paleo was a lot better. And um, he found that leptin sensitivity actually improved on that one as well. Um, so all these things point towards a good um, you know, paleo way of eating seems to be for me definitely and hopefully from the research you guys can see today um, and you can, can research it yourself further in your own time seems to be the way to go. Um, but what we're going to look at for you guys is you do need to eat carbohydrates, especially if you're doing events, sort of 90 minutes, so on and so forth. You've got to be, obviously you need your uh, blood muscle glycogen. But the thing is what I've found is that people tend to overdo the carbs when it comes to racing. I mean, I get it all the time, especially with new marathon, run, marathon runners. They come in and go, oh, should I carb up three weeks before? And, uh, or they'd have a, they'd go out for a big pasta meal the night before the marathon and they've never done that before. It's like... I really do overdo it a bit. Right. So, just uh, look at the uh, update eight of um, the paleo diet. So, you're going to have branch chain amino acids. You're going to have better branch chain amino acids within your body. Branch chain amino acids are three amino acids which are like the premiership of um, building blocks in your muscles. They've also been shown to help endurance, to improve power, and improve. Um, performance on, in cyclists. So triathletes in here, that will be good, and you assume that that will be the same thing for runners. Um, there's obviously more branch chain amino acids found in lean meat um, than grains, etc., etc. And on here I've got 33.7 grams and 1,000 calories of beef of uh, branch chain amino acids and 6 grams in grains. Being acidic, versus alkaline. Now we don't want to be too acidic because it breaks down muscle tissue and it's shown to reduce performance. So we want to try and keep the body um, alkalinic. Um, and the way we do that is all the foods that are on the paleo diet increase this alkalinity. Carbs, pastas, cheeses, all that sort of thing increases blood acidity, which we don't obviously want. Um, but trace mineral nutrients. The guy Joe Frill, who I've written here, he co-wrote the Paleo Diet book for athletes. Um, he reported that when he put people on the Paleo Diet, they had less colds, and it's, you know because they're having much more nutrients in their bodies from the, all the vegetables and the fruits that they're eating, rather than the pastas and the grains. Um, and then he just writes that at the end of the day, people overdo. He's found he's athletes. He's a triathlete, this guy, and now he coaches people in America. We found that people, um, he used to be like a Mr. Carb Man, you know, eating rice, pasta, etc., etc. And then he met up with Lauren Godain and took him to the paleo way of eating. He found his performance improved loads. Um, and so he now trains his athletes to eat the paleo way and he's found that their performance increased loads. So give it a go and see how you guys do it. He's found that he's, um, when they come to him for their assessments and stuff like that, that they just eat way too much carbohydrates that they're carrying, a bit of fat, etc. So, fuel for you guys, and this is taken from the paleo, this isn't my work, I must admit, this is taken from the, uh, the research I've read, especially in the Paleo Diet for Athletes book, which is written by Lauren Day and that Joe Frill guy. Um, you've got to try and, when you wake up to do your racing, you've got to try and fuel yourself. Definitely um, drink, obviously you've had a uh, good hydration lecture with the guys earlier on. Um, but they use this sort of equation, two to 300 calories per hour prior to the race, which I think is quite a good. And they obviously, that's eating proper food, it's not eating um, pastas and rices and things like that. Um, the closer you get to the race, the higher your GI is, so the more fruits and stuff you're probably taking. So if you're going for that two hours before, like your race is at 11, and you've got up at eight, and you've got to eat something, you're going to a bowl of fruit or something like that, that's quite high GI. If you've got a race at one, and then you've had breakfast at nine, make sure it's got a lot of fiber in it, more starchy carbohydrates, and then, then it will take a bit longer to digest and get into your bloodstream. Include branch chain amino acids? Definitely. Um, so eat protein with your meal. Um, and then your recovery. Got to obviously replace your carbohydrate stores. Immediately after is when you take in liquid with your um, 
uh, protein and carbohydrate because it obviously fuels the muscles much quicker. And the sooner we can get the muscles um, sourced with some um, nutrients, the lower this cortisol effect will occur and the better your um, recovery will be for your next race or the next training session. Um, as you go further into the day, so you start, I would start with a high GI drink using this formula, 4 to 1 or 5 to 1, and including your electrolytes. If you had the electrolyte test done, even better. Um, then I would later, like two hours later, think about your lunch or your dinner or something with your sweet potatoes and your meats and your vegetables and stuff like that. Obviously, try and avoid the wheat and the pasta. Um, and then just sort of as you go into the day and the next day you sort of go back into the paleo way of eating and if you need to lose weight I would steer clear of the starchy carbs etc etc um, does that make sense? everybody happy? cool ok so basically eat like that and you'll be like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> any question we've got to oh, let me just check the time we are running a little over we have a couple of questions. Anybody wants to grab me after? I can answer more questions, hopefully, if I can. Anybody got any questions? Yes. Well, the best ways to keep down cortisol, because I know, if, especially if you're doing long distance running, anything over an hour, your cortisol levels in the body just go so through. So, if you're running straight away, green tea has been shown. You've got other um, supplements such as liquid cream, collagen cells, a load of stuff, obviously. Um, that you can have. So there's a supplement, supplement like green tea extract and things like that will really help. But to be honest, if you refuel quickly, see how you go, measure yourself, try this method. If you find the cortisol levels aren't going down, then look into the supplement side of things. Um, first deal with food, then deal with supplements um, is my sort of method. Um, yeah. Any other questions? When you say keep the blood alkaline, which um yeah, I understand that, but um, the paleo diet's quite high protein, isn't that acidic forming, or is there enough there protein there? There is a there? Here. No, the, the, the lean meats you use should be uh, not as acidic as, we're sort of we're comparing to the carbs and, the the carbs and, and stuff yeah, like that, so okay. it's not as, well yes they are, but then you've got obviously the abundance Fish. of vegetables and yeah. things like you said, and that will keep it down, yeah, so if, in comparison, it's, um, it's much better to have the paleo diet if you wanted to keep your blood more alkalinic. Any others? No? Okay, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Okay, if you need any more information, you know where we are. Hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>